Okay, so it's been 30 years. Sounds better if you say it's only been 30 years. Um, so Fleischmann Pond's announcement. Um, I'm going to focus on excess heat. Um, when I began putting the review together, I thought well, I'm going to include all of what's in CMNS. And after spending a week and having way too many slides, I thought let's call it quits on excess heat. Um, we start with the Fleischmann Pons experiment. Here's Fleischmann, here's Pons, and here's the cell. Um, it looks like this. It's palladium uh, cathode is heavy water and lithium uh, deuteroxide 10th molar. Um, they saw temperature excess. The critics said that the temperature excess, purported temperature excess, is within the error bars associated with the noise, so you can't be sure it's true. I'm looking, I see some 20 degrees C. I think that's not within the error bars of the noise associated with the temperature measurements, so it looks good to me. The, um, this is from Flesh and Pons 1990 paper. The um, power excess is about a factor of 20. The amount of energy increase in this early experiment was on the order of factor of two. Um, again, a little bit bigger than the percent effect uh, claimed again and again and again by John Isenga, one of the critics in the field. In terms of the energy, um, the amount of energy reported in this experiment was uh, 0.63 megajoules. If you'd replace the volume of the palladium cathodes by TNT and detonated it, you would have gotten 1.2 kilojoules. Um, which is a small fraction of the total energy um, observed in this particular experiment. Okay, so lots and lots of energy, no commensurate uh, chemical products. Um, so Fleischmann conjectured that we had a nuclear effect. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you make uh, nuclear energy, you usually get uh, energetic nuclear radiation. In this case, we don't see an outcommensurate uh, amounts of energetic nuclear radiation. <coughs> Some experiments there are low level nuclear products. Uh, okay, so 1989, there were many issues raised. Uh, one is the effect uh, real or artifact. Um, is it nuclear? A giant question is how does it work? Um, and it can it work in cathodes cheaper than palladium in case of uh, commercial technologies? Um, the origin of the skepticism back in 1989, at least from my perspective, was theoretical. Um, Flesh and Pons, neither Flesh and Pons nor anyone else put together an acceptable theory. Um, there was the perception that there was no basis in nuclear physics, no basis in solid state physics for these effects. Um, that perception continues through today. Mainstream science doesn't think there's anything to it. Um, in 1989, the name called fusion brought people to focus on the fusion part. Uh, DD fusion um, has been well understood since probably the 1950s. Um, there's an issue about the Coulomb barrier, how to get your deuterons to be close. Um, if you do manage to get them to fuse by what we know from basically four-body four nuclear physics is you get three plus one products and um, they occur roughly 50-50. Um, there was early discussion of helium-4 as a product um, and the physicists and skeptics argued well if you get uh, helium four, where's the twenty four and maybe gamma? Because it wasn't it wasn't observed. So let's think a little bit about the experiment itself. Um, electrochemical experiment in palladium takes um, deuterium from from the heavy water and through the H E R or D E R reactions brings the deuterium into the lattice, so it goes interstitial. So here the gray circles are the palladium and the red is the uh, uh, hydrogen or deuterium. So if you have succeeded in loading it fully, you get a structure that looks something like this. You get 
palladium nuclei sort of in the corners, you get deuterium in the middle, um, you sort of get uh, checkerboard structure, three-dimensional checkerboard. Now, um, if, if you're a solid state physicist and you look at this lattice, you say this is a very well-known, very understood lattice, and you wouldn't expect anything to happen. Um, the deuterium atoms are pretty far apart from one another. There's, there's nothing magical here. Simple structure, you do your electrochemistry, you make your simple structure. Why does this cause the magic to happen uh, the quantum inflation claims? So that's those are the, the big issues. Um, so I'm thinking about this. The initial claim was unexpected, unpredicted. Um, it cannot be overemphasized uh, the importance of this if it's real. Um, we could solve the energy problem, solve the climate change problem, we could get clean water for people throughout the world. Um, let me tell you what robotics would do with a light, um, high energy density power source. Uh, space travel would be revolutionized and there's many other applications. Um, if, you know, back in 1989, the flesh and correct, then there's um, a lack of rather basic understanding of fundamental issues in nuclear physics and solid state physics. Um, once again, I, I cannot overemphasize the fundamental impact on society of a technology based on this effect. So is it real? And again, this is it real, this is 1989, is it real? This is not a 2019, uh, is it real? Um, the way you tell whether it's real is you go in the lab and you start doing experiments. And so initially, quite a large number of experiments were done. There's an early experiment from SRI, and what was observed is an excess heat burst. Um, the excess heat burst sort of is initiated by a current ramp going up. Here's an early um, experimental result from Los Alamos, uh, from Ed Storms. Again, so an excess heat recombiner failure, but it seems to work. Uh, here's an important result from Imra in Japan. Um, excess heat, this is current density, and at, uh, above a threshold level of current density, excess heat seems to appear. Um, SR, I have a lot of SRI slides because in the early days I worked with SRI, so I was very familiar with their experiments and their technology. They put in a they had a 15-man effort. They put in a very large amount of money, time, and effort into building a, a flow calorimeter. Um, at the time, the isoparabolic calorimetry in flesh and ponds um, measured temperature inside, measured temperature outside, and thermal resistance was very, very strong. Criticized. The flow calorimeter was constructed uh, in response to that criticism as being a different way to measure something. And again, um, excess heat was seen, apparently stimulated by the current ramps. Um, in the early days, the thought was you put in deuterium, you get excess heat. You put in hydrogen, like water, you don't get excess heat. Uh, in this case, this, um, you know, this is one of the most shown slides from the SRI experiment, which shows the results from two cells run um, at the same time, basically in series, the same uh, electrochemical current going through um, the heavy water cell also went through the light water cell. And um, the heavy water cell gave some excess power, the light water cell didn't. Um, there's a headache with that because Fleischmann, uh, when people ask them about that, Fleischmann was smiling and say, well, some of our light water cells give excess heat too, so it's not a perfect uh, uh, control. Um, I, I would get shot if I didn't include <laughs> <laughs> from Mitchell, and once again, Mitchell, thank you for organizing this conference and all the work that you've done in it. <laughs> so, so Mitchell's done a very large number of experiments, maybe more than anybody else in the field. Uh, this is from his fuser, which is uh, palladium coiled, very much not the way Fleischmann uh, uh, did it, with electrolyte that was pure, uh, uh, heavy water without salt uh, in it. And uh, basically, if you have a resistor, the output power is matched to the input power. 
if you have your fuser, the input power is here, the output power is there. So this power gain and uh, uh, Mitchell saw reproducible uh, excess power. As I recall, it's only about a factor of three or so in the fuser. <laughs> okay, so by now there have been hundreds, and, and I'm thinking that maybe, probably, we're, we might have reached the thousands at this point of uh, demonstration of excess uh, heat effect. Um, instead of worrying about whether it's real or not, um, there's ongoing both contemplation and research directed towards uh, potential commercial products. Um, from my nickel, the effect is real, and uh, a lot of other people are putting in a lot more than a nickel um, on the bet that it's real. Um, okay. <coughs> so Mitchell talked a bit about excess heat and helium. Uh, Fleischmann uh, speculated early on that, that what was going on in his experiment was D plus D going to helium-4 with 24 MeV uh, as heat. This is, of course, unacceptable as a physics um, mechanism uh, out of the box. Nevertheless, um, where is the helium? Um, the first report observation of heat and helium correlation was by Miles Bush and Legowski. Sadly, I'm, Miles was going to be here to talk about it, and sadly he's, he's not going to make it. Uh, we, we learned later on from Miles that from um, correspondence between him and Fleischmann, Fleischmann had actually measured the helium-4 um, prior to the announcement, so it was, it was Fleischmann who, who actually first observed the effect. Uh, the data which knocked me over when I first saw it was from a group in Italy, got Daniel Gotzi and the collaborators. And um, what they did is they had time resolved measurements of the excess heat, and they had time resolved measurements of the helium production. And on top is the helium, on the bottom is the excess heat or excess power. So there's a heat burst and a corresponding helium burst. There's heat burst, corresponding helium, more heat, more helium. Um, Little or no heat, little or no helium. So a temporal correlation was established between the heat and uh, helium. It was um, absolutely stunning. The question is, what about the power balance? The mass difference is 24 MeV. So the question is, can this be consistent with experiment? In the Gotzi experiment, the heat pulses that came out were between 10%, well, 50%, 70% of the the correlation between the heat and the helium wasn't matched at one per one for 24 MeV per. In um, at SRI, they did measurement using cases catalyst uh, gas loading experiment. They measured um, helium, they measured energy, and from the slope you can get the energy per um, reaction or per helium. And in this case, it's 32 MeV, and we were hoping for 24. And so, um, at Gossie's talk, Mike and I were scratching and saying, why is it not one every single time? And Mike says, oh, you, you theorist. Um, <laughs> some of the helium hangs out in the uh, uh, cathode. And so, in order to see it all, you need to scrub it all out. By now, there's been two experiments where that's been attempted. One was the M4 experiment at SRI. So in this experiment, current ramp induced an excess heat burst, uh, but an excess heat burst showed up uh, subsequently, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. But this was done in a helium link type calorimeter, and uh, helium was sampled, um, and so the initial helium measurement came out at 62% of the amount of helium that you would hope for given the energy produced. So Mike thought, well, maybe if we bring all the deuterium out, maybe it'll bring some of the helium out. So they got a little bit more helium, and uh, but, um, so it got up to 69%. Uh, the rest was having trouble coming out, so Mike says, well, if you can't convince it to come out gently, maybe we'll have to hammer it out. So they, they uh, heated the cathode up, and um, from the heating of it up, uh, more of the uh, helium four came out. By the time they were done with the measurements, they were essentially at 
um, spot on the amount of helium that you would have expected given the energy produced at 24 MeV. Okay, so um, a, a similar, well, another experiment was done in Ennio Frascati where an attempt was made to scrub all the helium out and to within the accuracy of the measurement, it also gave 24 MeV. Um, so the excess energy in the helium-4 measured seems to be consistent with the mass difference of two deuterons going to helium-4. Um, we need more, uh, more experiments uh, to gain more confidence in this result, but this is the, the uh, basis of a lot of people's thinking in, in terms of mechanism. Okay, so helium seems to be there, and if the helium is there, then I suggest we want to get deuterium into the experiment. Probably we need to get the experiment, the deuterium, into the right places such that it'll actually do something. Um, I have been thinking about talking about historical development of the field. I would succeed in putting everybody to sleep. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce around talking about one issue or another, which I think is interesting and I think has proven to be important over the years. We'll talk a little bit about triggering. So, um, but back in the very early days, one of the big problems that we were pulling our hair out is how in the world do you kick the stupid stuff and get it to produce some excess heat? Um, at SRI, it was noticed that um, raising the current density slowly, and you can imagine just flipping it from low to high, that didn't seem to be effective, but a current ramp seemed to be more effective. The question at the time was, why was that effective? So, you know, Mike asked me, what do you think's going on? And Mike was expecting I would answer, and then he would use the opposite of my answer to proceed with the experiments, because the anti-correlation was rather good at the time. I was arguing that you needed to get phonons present to get things started. I was kind of thinking laser kind of thing. So if you want to get a laser to go, it works much better if you put some light in initially because it draws more of the light down. You can extract energy that way. So all my models at the time worked like that. So if you put in phonons, you put in vibrations, you, maybe you can draw down the nuclear energy. So the proposal was that the deuterium flux um, makes phonons. My proposal, one of the ones that actually seems to have, have has something to do with experiment. So the, back to this M4 uh, experiment. So there's a ramp. So the ramp, well, the deuterium hopping from site to site causes things to vibrate. That's phonons, that's the terahertz phonons that we were looking for. But here, there's a heat pulse that sort of turned on sort of by itself. And it uh, turns out when Mike and Fran and others looked at the data, they found that M4 was breathing. So the deuterium was going in and out. So Mike thought, okay, well, let's make a predictor so he made up a predictor function here that included a term having to do with the deuterium going in and out. And when he did that, he can get the green line, which is the empirical predictor, and the data, which are the circles, to sort of match one another. And so that gave us some confidence that the uh, excess heat was responding to the deuterium flux going through the surface. Um, we draw attention to the energetics experiment. So energetics had a foil. They have this funny super wave construction. You say, what the heck is a super wave? Well, the way I think about it is you go in the morning and you can open up your desk and your desk gets stuck. How do you open your desk? You yank on it and it doesn't come. So you take, you yank it and you rattle it back and forth and then it goes straight. Well, that's my thing. That's, that's sort of what all this uh, super wave stuff is, is doing. Um, so there's the famous. Uh, foil number 64, which gave, here's the input power, here's the output power. Uh, again, was reported on, on the order of a factor 25 for, the, for this um, experiment. So the idea is that the super wave would have times where the, it would push the deuterium in at the surface and pull it out and it would rattle back and forth. And this is effective in helping to load. Apparently it also helps to get, get some excess heat as well. Um, <coughs> Xing Zhang Li presented an experiment. He also published it in, in JFIS D, which is a, a mainstream journal. And um, the idea was to um, pump up the tube with uh, deuterium 
and have it flow through a palladium foil. So the idea is that the flow would come on with the deuterium flux. And um, Xing Zhang Li saw some, uh, so here's the flux, and the flux induced um, some excess heat. Um, so he, he was very careful not to mention Fleischmann Fonts in the JFISD paper, which, um, you know, had he done it, might have uh, inhibited it getting uh, uh, published. Um, Mitchell's fuser experiment, once again, um, because of the way he did it, the anode is over here, and he's got a very asymmetric um, current profile. So the current is bringing the deuterium to the surface on the edge of his cathode, and he's not, so in the flesh and pond scat experiment, an effort's made to have the current come in uniformly from all directions to try to maximize the loading. Um, in Mitchell's experiment, the, the loading's not being maximized by the other hand when the deuterium goes in. It's got all kinds of directions to flow too. So this would be a way to maximize the deuterium flux. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, Mitchell's fuser works so well. Uh, another issue is that um, when you tightly wrap, um, make the coil, you introduce stress, which I think is also a good thing for reasons that will be talked about before too long. Okay, so excess heat is stimulated by deuterium flux. Um, I think that's because of the uh, presence of terahertz photons. That has not been proven uh, experimentally uh, at this point, um, unambiguously. Um, so the picture also has the nuclear energy going into vibrations. The question is, is can we you know, examine that issue uh, experimentally? So, um, so Dennis Letts uh, came to me one day and said, well, you've got these uh, crazy theories, Peter, and I know, I know that you're mad as a hatter, and I tried to explain to him I am not a nerd. And, uh, <laughs> he and I have that clear uh, at, at this point. So he said, well, if all this is true, how would you show it? And I would say, well, one way to do it is you could use at that point, he'd gotten a single laser experiment to work, where it shines a single laser and it simulates an excess heat pulse. So, use two lasers. Use one at one frequency, one at a different frequency, and tune the difference in frequencies and scan in the terahertz region. And if you're on resonance for the vibrations, then you'll see excess heat because you pump it, and if you're off resonance, then you're not going to get much of it. So, it's, duh, this is a way to, to put this crazy theorist in this place. And, um, Five years later, I get a call from him. He says, I got this data. Can you help me understand it? So here's the experiment. He's got one laser coming in. He's got another laser coming in. And it turns out, um, Let's had one experiment years earlier, which seemed to respond to having magnets on it. So ever since then, he's put magnets on it. So years ago, I used to think, you know, ah, these silly experimentalists, they're superstitious. Uh, however, we're doing experiments now, and every time we or he does a new experiment, so, well, you know, are you going to change something that worked before? <laughs> you know, don't think of that at all. So I, I've now been infected with the same degree of superstitiousness. Anyway, um, what, what would happen is, in run it, there'd be no excess heat. If you turn the lasers on, with the frequency difference being matched to the correct one, and in this case, I think this is close to um, one of the resonances near 16 terahertz. Um, anyway, it would, the laser turns on to simulate an excess heat burst. And um, so he did this again and again and again with different frequencies, and the frequency difference seemed to show up in sweet spots. So he said, we're getting sweet spots, and he's saying that at least in two cases, these two sweet spots were at the frequencies that you had said that you thought they might be. And the question is, what's going on with the third one? So the arguments for the two sweet spots, one is the eight terahertz uh, gamma point. You say, gamma L, what's all this about? Anyway, the gamma point is where the phonons have um, zero net momentum. Um, and this L point is where they're sort of going out next Y and Z with sort of a maximum kind of momentum. Anyway, one frequency is here, the other frequency is here. That corresponds to um, this guy and this guy. And then what's going on with this guy? So 
One, we don't actually know, but one conjecture is that if you have some hydrogen impurity, you develop uh, an analog of the L point mode up at, at a frequency recently close to where the observation is. Okay, so importance of the two laser experiment is it gives indirect evidence of the energies going directly into the vibrations. Um, Mitchell one day came and he said, well, um, instead of saying that this is supportive and so forth, what do you have to do to prove it? He said, well, Mitchell, you have to do a Raman experiment, because if you do a Raman experiment, then you get to see the vibrations directly. So Mitchell says, well, how do you do a Raman experiment? I said, well, you have to write a check for a gazillion dollars. You have to bring in a narrow, you know, very stabilized narrow frequency laser. You've got to get like triple monochromator to do Raman spectroscopy and so forth. And Mitchell went on the internet and found somebody 3D printed out something. He says, well, you know, I'll do this. So if I'm not mistaken, I think this might be the one of the very first Raman experiments done with an LED laser which is a wideband laser, and it's very much not like the super-duper narrow-band laser that, that um, Ron was done before. <clears throat> and so if there's no excess heat, um, Mitchell sees a Stokes line along with the Rayleigh line, and when it runs with excess heat, he sees the anti-Stokes showing up. And the anti-Stokes would not show up unless there was very strong vibrations. Um, in this case, somewhere in the neighborhood of four and a half terahertz, which I think um, is roughly matched to a strong vibrational uh, band in zirconium oxide. Uh, so this is the nano nanner has zirconium oxide holding the palladium nanoparticles. Um, anyway, this also is consistent with the picture in which the nuclear energy is going into vibrations. Doesn't, again, still not quite a, a proof. Um, but um, from my point of view, I'm very strongly encouraged by it. I'm going to talk about, about loading. Um, so we want to get deuterium into the cathode. How can we do it? Well, there's lots of ways to do it. Electrochemical loading, you can goose the electrochemical loading by doing it in upper pressure deuterium. You can do it at high temperature in a molten salt environment. You can gas load, you can ion beam load, you can glow discharge loading. Um, you can do CPD loading. There are, there are other things. Let me talk briefly about a, a fuel cell sort of a kind of approach. In this case, it's a deuterium overpressure of 5 to 10 atmospheres uh, by Kunimatsu and some of the IMRA folks. And what they see is excess heat when they turn the current up. There's a threshold and the excess heat goes up, which other people saw as well uh, in the early days. At the conference where this was presented, McCubrey had also presented. And McCubrey, one of McCubrey's big results was the excess heat depends on loading. And McCubrey had a curve something like this. And then uh, Kunimatsu's curve sort of worked the same way, that if you're at a loading below about 0.83 or so, you don't see much excess heat. As loading increases, you get more uh, excess heat. Um, McCubrey and the SRI guys had earlier done high pressure uh, experiments, and I'm remembering, you know, all these years I've been remembering it was a few thousand atmospheres uh, in France here. Do you remember? Was it 10,000? Yeah, it was 5,000 psi. Oh, 5,000 psi. So it's not, it's not good. It's okay. Um, uh, Liao and uh, Bruce Liebert and so forth put together a molten salt experiment. So they had um, a lithium chloride, potassium chloride eutectic. And um, I was looking at this and, and it says palladium anode. And I thought, palladium anode? Palladium's supposed to be the cathode, that's supposed to be the anode. I thought, maybe I better read his paper. <laughs> and um, the lithium gives up this electron. The, Deuterium captures the electrons, so it's negatively charged. So the, the palladium cyanide this time. Anyway, in this experiment, um, when they increase the current density, they see an excess uh, uh, power res result. And I was thinking this would be really interesting because if you want to make a commercial product, you'd really like to have the te operating temperature be high. So if you're going to see electrochemistry and you want to get to elevated temperature, the molten salt approach might be one. Um, very early days, um, 
an experiment was done at Luch Institute. I said, what's the Luch Institute? Never been a particle size up to uh, hundreds and thousands. Uh, the, the Japanese have, have had lots of luck recently. Their particle sizes, I don't even remember, is like 30 angstroms, 50 angstroms, 30 angstroms, something in that general region. Um, so advantage, they load very, very fast. Um, it's observed that the power density is very, very high, and you can go to high temperature, where high temperature 200C, 300C has been uh, uh, worked with. Um, hopefully you will remember, we'll talk some about the Japanese work. Um, and an advantage is that the modern materials seem to work very well with good reproducibility. Um, so here's a um, diagram experiment from the recent paper publication by uh, Kitamura Takahashi. Again, my hat's off. Takahashi is uh, the, the local leader of this effort. Takahashi's made so many contributions over the years, um, and he's done a very competent job of bringing this um, you know, a campaign to uh, many successes. So here's, here's one uh, plot for the recent results. You, you get excess heat and it goes on for um, some, you know, basically a long time. Um, and this is a very healthy amount of excess heat. This is from a palladium nickel in uh, zirconium oxide. I think this excess heat is from deuterium. Um, uh, but they also get positive results from hydrogen. In fact, if I'm, my reading in their papers is correct, uh, uh, most of their positive results are from hydrogen. The hydrogen works a little bit better than the deuterium in these things. So if you think about it, get your nanomaterial. Of course, making the nanomaterials a pain and lots of steps and technically challenging. But once you have it, add gas, heat, and think of excess heat. What could be sent for? Um, uh, so, so there's been extended uh, effort in Japan. There's uh, efforts elsewhere looking at nano, uh, nanomaterials as well. George Miley uh, has been working on. Um, the Japanese effort is really interesting because they have multiple labs and collaborations. They get one materials, they test it one labs and another labs and another labs. They get uh, independent confirmations locally that works, that uh, prevents errors. And the uh, and technical exchange is very, very powerful. My, my hat's off to the Japanese effort. You can tell I'm impressed by their effort. Um, okay, you can sy they've systematically tested a, a lot of um, different nano uh, combinations. And I'm guessing that there's been a lot more sets of materials that haven't worked than ones that have worked, which is what you do when you test through a lot of materials. Um, uh, copper, nickel, zirconium oxide. Again, palladium is expensive. This is the elements are much cheaper here. With hydrogen, it seems attractive for commercial application. Also, with deuterium, it would be attractive for commercial applications. I'm going to talk a little bit about Mitchell Sanner. Mitchell works with uh, nanomaterial, which again could be zirconium oxide matrix, I think he's tried other matrices as well. Um, palladium nanomaterials, nickel nanomaterials, palladium nickel nanomaterials, and I'm guessing other nanomaterials he hasn't told us about. Loads something like this, he jams it into a region, has it loaded and seals it, has a current come through, wire connector, wire connector, applies voltage across, and when he puts on the voltage, current flows, and excess heat comes. So here's an example from 2012 from the um, IEP meeting at this time. So if you have a resistor, the power that goes in is the same power that comes out. If you apply power to the nanner, you get more power out than you put in by a big factor. And you do it again and again and again. But at, at MIT, this thing ran for five and a half months. It, the amount of power exceeded the chemical uh, in the first 45 minutes or so of running. Um, I think I, I think this important uh, technology with potential commercial applications. Um, Mitchell found, hopefully we'll talk about it uh, during his presentations, with a strong transient magnetic field, he got a big boost in the game. Um, okay, I'm getting close to the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about nano PD. Bulk palladium and palladium deuteride, palladium hydride is well studied. Nano PD is different. The question is, what makes nano PD magical? What is special about nano PD? Um, so why does it work better in the sense that you know, you've got your nanomaterial, just add gas, heat, 
where he and Gas pillage them from. You do one and then the other, I'm not sure how much. But it just, um, when it works, it just works. You don't have to, but with the, the foils and rods, you have to load for ages, you have to have current protocol, you have to have the right stuff in your soup, and so forth and so forth. So why? Let me begin by looking at the isotherms. Uh, here's a paper where people measured um, isotherms. So the black is the isotherms for powder, which sort of works similar to, to bulk, um, not quite as wide as for bulk. Um, when you make your nanomaterial smaller, then you get, um, it's easier to load, and you get a narrowing of the miscibility gap. You make it even smaller, um, then it, you begin to lose the, the miscibility gap. Okay, so nanomaterials are easy to load. That doesn't explain what's unique about them, what's magical about them. And I thought, well, the question is, um, I, as some of you know, and I'll give a paper on it, I've been interested in octahedral versus tetrahedral occupations. So the octahedral sites are the points in the checkerboard where you'd expect things to go, the tetrahedral and the interior sites. Um, in this experiment, nanoparticles were measured with neutron diffraction, and um, uh, basically you get lines in the diffraction spectrum. That you get one spectrum to show up if it's FCC, and if you get lots of vacancies in order of vacancy phase, you get new lines showing up. And um, um, for neutron scattering, they saw the you know they they saw lines that were consistent with scattering off of deuterium and tetrahedral sites. And they estimate their tetrahedral occupation at elevated temperature to be about um, 30%. And, and that is shocking. To me, this was, this is getting towards why the, the um, materials are magical. So for example, I want to see octahedral site occupation next to tetrahedral site occupation. In their analysis, they said, ah, what's happening is that in the surface region, the last a little bit bigger, the tetrahedral site comes down, you can get occupation two sites and O sites in the middle. Um, it's more like the bulk, so you get O site occupation. So their conclusion, which is followed up by a density functional calculation later on, said, well, yes, this is how it works, so they're happy with it. Okay, not quite the end of the story. So um, this is all of this. So if, if what they argued was true, then, from my point of view, what's magical about the nanoparticles would be completely clear and we can understand it. However, here's a, another paper where X-ray diffraction was used on nanoparticles. So in this case, it's pure palladium, but this was done in connection with the study of hydrogen and deuterium loading in palladium. So I don't know if the opinion, you know, the paper's not clear, but I don't know if the opinion that this is an X-ray spectrum from uh, um, nanoparticles that have been loaded. And what you see is the 220 showing up, and you see PDFM3M. Now, some years ago, if I'd read that, I said FM3M, so crazy group, and go on and not read that. But then, I read Foucault's papers, and Foucault's papers, um, and in subsequent papers, explain what FM3M means. FM3M means the, the Foucault vacancy phase. And so, this is the only data at the moment that I have in my hands of um, nanoparticles showing a Foucault phase. So the thinking is, um, I would have, again, I would have expected that the uh, nanoparticles would be able to make Foucault phase really easily. I would not have expected the bulk like the in the middle and the octahedral occupation of the corners. And so at the moment, we got two opinions in the literature what we really need is we need for a systematic study to answer this question. Do we have vacancies in the nanoparticles or do we have tetrahedral loading near the uh, edges? Um, anyway, that's the last, I think, near the last topic. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the temperature effect. Fleisch and Ponce described the temperature effect. So basically, if there's no excess power, if they put on the calibration pulse, the power initially continues on the power afterwards. If they are producing excess heat, then if they put a calibration pulse, when the temperature comes down, it comes down to a higher point. So they use that to put in calibration pulse, calibration pulse, calibration pulse to nurse up the temperature higher and higher and higher to get up to boil off. So back uh, 
ICCF3, this was their new uh, protocol, which strangely enough has not particularly been followed up on subsequently, but I think this is really important. Um, here's an observation of Cravens. He's got power, he puts in a calibration pulse, and then the excess power is higher uh, afterwards, or temperature is higher. Um, a number of people studied this. Mitchell studied, here's data from a study with storms. Uh, basically, the excess power increases with temperature, and if you plot an Arrhenius plot, you can figure out what the delta E is associated with it. And storms found 673 millivolts, which was consistent with helium diffusion through palladium. So the picture is, you're running out to see if your D2 goes to helium-4, the helium-4, in my view, where's it going? It piles up in these mono-vacancies. It's like you burn logs in your fireplace, and the more logs you burn, the more ash clogs up your fireplace, and at some point you've got to like clean out the ash. Um, so I think that um, this temperature dependence is telling us that the mono-vacancies in the Fleischer Pons experiment get clogged up with helium, and the helium diffusion out to the surface is limiting it. Also, because you see the helium coming out in gas phase in the early day experiments, that means that the uh, active sites are very near the surface, otherwise the helium would be stuck and wouldn't make it out to the surface. Um, okay, so question is, if you have a nanoparticle, you minimize the distance you have to go to get your helium out. So. I've been talking about this for years. Arata talked about this at ICCF 17, um, and his proposal is independent of mine. My right, conclusions. Fleischmann's announcement 30 years ago. Wait, only 30 years ago. So only 30 years ago. Uh, much skepticism and controversy then. Also in my ministry of skepticism and controversy now. Um, in my view, excess heat effect is real. It will change society. A huge amount of progress made in three decades of experiment, ongoing work towards commercialization. Um, Nickel-based um, experiments and nickel-based nanomaterials are very promising for uh, commercial applications. So when Mitchell asked me to give this talk, he said, well, I'm going to talk about all the various things. There's transmutation, there's tritium, there's low-level nuclear emissions, there's collimated x-rays, there's excitation transfer, and I've been making slides all week. Collapse the heat heap, and so I, I'm ending my talk now, mostly because of exhaustion, not because... <laughs> Yeah, well, you talk about helium possibly clogging up the uh, 